The World Economic Forum tells us, a report by the World Economic Forum tells us, that SMEs represent more than 90% of all companies globally. They create up to 80% of jobs and generate up to 70% of GDP in Africa alone. SMEs operating within the special economic zones have become a popular topic due to the interest of African governments in capitalizing the benefits of the African continental free trade area. Good day and welcome to this special broadcast. I am Zanella Morrison. SMEs do play a major role as an economic driver and there are many growth opportunities available and in today's broadcast, we will be speaking to a panel of experts to explore ways to accelerate SMEs within the OR Tambo Special Economic Zone. But before we do that, let me introduce our panel of experts. Let's take a look at how SMEs fit into the OR Tambo SEZ. Here's the scene setter for you. I love Johannesburg. I love the energy. The city of gold, Egoli, whatever you want to call it, there's an energy here about people that want to do things and get things done and just take advantage of opportunities. There's always a question of, does South Africa have the skills, capabilities required to drive this business? And if I were to invest in South Africa, do you have the people that would support my business? Our short answer is yes. We're also looking at the newer sectors. We are looking at the pharmaceutical, the health cluster. We are looking at electronics. We are looking at fuel cells. This is a new industry, very, very exciting. We have green hydrogen that's rapidly developing into one of the biggest business drivers in, in the world. And that green hydrogen relies on South African-based platinum group metals. We have tremendous support from the Department of Trade and Industry. And we're now at the execution stage where you get entities like the GIDZ and the Kauteng government coming in and setting up with the DTR, the special economic zones, that will then also help give us additional incentives to take this into full manufacturing. We are proud of the fact that we are creating a core of young graduate interns learning from the best in the world. So we're creating the skills for our future. We all know unemployment levels are simply unsustainable. So this could be very much a industry that creates brand new jobs, creates new revenue and helps us as an economy re-industrialize. So we need to grasp this opportunity with both hands. I love economic development. I love this business. The citizenry of Gauteng and South Africa is hungry for growth and we as government has a responsibility to work with the private sector to deliver on that promise. Let's meet our panelists for today and they'll be taking this conversation further. Tepiso Mahoti is the Chief Director of Strategic Partnerships and Customer Care at the Industrial Financing Branch at the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Zanele Fakude. Zanele Fakude is the Head Trade and Export Development at GGDA. Saki Zamkaka. Zamkaka is the CEO of the Gauteng Enterprise Propeller. Cornelius Mluli, Senior Investment Associate, Strategic Projects Funds at the National Empowerment Fund. Kiele Bokapule is the founder of Nguni Diamonds. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really look forward to this conversation that can never um, lack interest and passion from so many SMEs who join us on a daily basis. So thank you so much for joining us. And we speak mainly around the OR Tambo SEZ. And if I could start with you, Zanele, what has the SEZ meant for you and your organization as you aim to support and build South Africa's SME base? Thank you, um, Zanele. Um, the SEZ basically is an economic zone um, was set up um, to support industrial development in Gauteng, um, focusing on mineral beneficiation, export-oriented and value-added industries. Um, and what we are doing as uh, the Gauteng government basically is to bring SMMEs into the fore, to bring them into the value chains of uh, the multinationals that are setting up at the SEZ. And what we do is basically to de-risk them and prepare them for the economy. Thank you. That's really good, uh, Zanella. I think without government's backing and support and also oversight, it's difficult for all other structures, you know, to effectively support SMEs. But 
The government also has helped to ensure that there's funding available from the various institutions. At Tepiso, you've been doing this for many years. How do you see the collaboration between your organization and SCZ helping SMEs to find opportunities to grow their business? Uh, the DTIC actually provides a uh, lot of support in terms of uh, financial and non-financial support to SMEs uh, in general. If I can think of the housing, you know, SEZ and the jewelry uh, sector and all that, you would find that um, there's financial support that's being uh, provided to uh, those SMEs that are located in the SEZ. And in general, we uh, not only provide money, but the uh, you know the SMEs that are located in the SEZ derive value from uh, tax you know benefits. For instance, uh, uh, preferential you know corporate tax. There is building allowance when they are building up their uh, factories over there. There's employment uh, incentives to incentivize them to employ as many people as possible because we know the challenge facing South Africa more than anything is that one of uh, unemployment. And if they are located within the customs controlled area, they derive even more benefits with respect to uh, uh, tax. But there are many other incentives that maybe I'll talk about later that uh, SMEs can qualify for when they would like to be supported by the DTIC. Thank you. And SMEs really have to take a a, a, a proper look at what's on mm -hmm. offer because they are so they, they, the, the conversation is always around incentivizing and making it easier for them to do business. So it's really great to hear about all the, the, those offerings. Um, Saki, in terms of what SMEs say they need and what SCZ offers, do you see further benefits, mutual benefits between the two? Oh, thank you, Zanele. Um, definitely. Um, so the ITZ and GTA both fall under the Department of Economic Development. So they basically sister agencies to us. Um, so we have a responsibility to collaborate with them where they are finding opportunities. But what we've also done is that to have a joint fund we've done with um, the ITC and the SASME fund. Um, where SASME fund put 100 million, ITC put 100 million, we put 100 million. It was launched only yesterday and we showcased some of the projects that we're funding. So the province is putting a lot of money behind SMEs, whether they are startup or doing contract finance or existing businesses that want to expand. And, and you're putting the money where it reaches the SME whilst they're working um, at the incubator. Yeah. So, so Cornelius, if you could come in, and again, we're speaking to the SME trying to be part of the fund. How, how does your organization, how does the NEF generally help to um, equip the SME with what they need? Is it whilst they're at the, at, the, at the incubator or perhaps even before to qualify to be in the incubator? Thank you so much, um, Zanele. Uh, thanks for hosting us today. But as the NEF, uh, we actually get involved with projects um, all the way from development stage. We actually have a specific department within the NEF uh, called the Strategic Project Fund that assists projects um, that are in development stage all the way starting from the uh, pre-feasibility studies to bankable feasibility studies. We also assist with capital raising and we see them through to uh, commercial operation. We become a part of the project uh, as a shareholder uh, at times um, and we, we give various types of funding instruments. Our specialization really is on the SMEs as well as um, you know, funding uh, black owned um, uh, institutions. Thank you, Daniela. So it, so it is on these processes, these funds raised, that the SCZ is then able to support the SME. Let's hear from an SME who has been uh, incubated um, within, within SCZ. Jalebocha, uh, so proud of the work that you are doing. How has it helped you to be part of this grouping of funders to be at the SCZ? 
Thank you so much, Zanele. I'm, I'm very much encouraged by what I'm hearing some of the, the panelists talk about, about what is available out there to help SM, SMEs. Um, myself, uh, what, what has, has happened with uh, Nungu Diamonds since partnering with one of the world's biggest diamond cutters and polishers, we've set up at the SEZ. We haven't yet taken occupation of the building. We've taken up a, a 1,067 square meters of one entire building. The plan there is to set up a cutting and polishing factory, one that we intend to be very aggressive in terms of job creation. We're looking to employ an excess of 100 people. And the, the, the intention behind that is to utilize the, the SEZ's incentives, particularly the tax incentives. You know, the diamond industry is very capital intensive. If you just make one example, you buy a pass of rough diamonds for 100 million rand. If you have to pay VAT in addition to that, it's 15 million rand that goes to the receiver. The cash now is being part of the SEZ. We have the, the unique opportunity to trade without some of these issues, such as um, VAT, uh, which, which I'm speaking to now. And, and, and like I say, I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear that the, the funding opportunities that are available for SMEs, and these are some that we will definitely be tapping into. Thank you so much, Anil. Thank you so much, Gelebocha. And I will come back. I, I, think, I think you spoke and made an example of the benefits and what it actually means. And when you count those numbers, it's a lot of money to be able to get breathing room um, you know, and, and to continue to grow your business. Government is really putting its eye on a number of, um, of these types of incentives to, to try and, and unlock. Zanele, could you give us a view of what, what, what it is that you're trying to, to make easier for SMEs to thrive in an, in an economy and we need them so badly to thrive? What else are you looking at? Thank you, Zanele. Um, basically, what is lacking for most SMEs largely is info, um, information. We have a lot of uh, funding institutions around and um, some are here on the panel. Um, but you find that informa um, SMEs don't know how to get from point A to uh, point B. So what we do as um, the GGDA, we get uh, companies to be export ready. So we provide them with training. Um, we provide them um, entry level and uh, basically advanced, uh, advanced training. Once they are trained in exporting, we also make sure that they become competitive because we want them to be competitive globally. Uh, we want them to take opportunities of uh, the AFCFTA that um, was implemented last year and uh, started trading um, yesterday uh, between Kenya and Ghana. Um, we want them also to play in the space of uh, e-commerce. Um, I mean, the pandemic really changed the scenario in terms of... I think I've lost you for a minute there, Zanele. Thank you so much. Um, I think export readiness, I definitely want to come back to that conversation uh, and how we actually take advantage of the trade, the free trade agreement, uh, area agreement for, for your SMEs. I thought I could go to you, Tepi, um, Tepi so, and talk about other tools. You know, we, 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 want, we want SMEs to thrive, to export uh, globally. What are the tools that are made available to them to get ready and to be able to trade much more effectively locally as well as in, in an export market? As I mentioned earlier, as the DTIC, we provide um, financing and non-financial you know, non support to SMEs. And in terms of the um, uh, financial support that we provide, it will be under manufacturing, it will be in innovation, it will be in export promotion as Zanella, my colleague, has already uh, mentioned. What we do, especially for those that would like to showcase their products and services outside South Africa, we provide them with uh, funding for, you know, the air ticket, for, you know, transporting their samples, for whatever it is, the stands that they will need when they are showcasing their uh, products there. In this way, because we provide 100% for SMEs, we are assisting them in terms of reducing the cost of doing the business and opening those markets. But before they can, we can even send them out of South Africa to go and expose themselves. We offer them, you know, expert readiness courses as well to make sure that at least they are ready, you know, to be, you know, to be supported. One other thing that we've just started in the DTI with effect from the 1st of uh, September 
is you would find that SMEs use a lot of paperwork in the same way that we were doing as well. We've introduced an, um, an incentive online, you know, support, starting with the expert marketing and investment assistance scheme, because we think it is such an important incentive that can open doors for many companies in South Africa, especially the SMEs. And we are focusing on Africa in general. So we are assisting them and making it easier for them not to be busy with all that paperwork, but to sub, you know, to submit everything online. And if there's a problem, it's picked up immediately at, at any one stage. Uh, we, together with the, uh, our clients, the SMEs, we can track the status of the application at any time. So it has done away with a wastage of time that the SME owners were exposed to, where you'd find that a lot of their work was spent on administrative issues that really did not add so much value to what they were supposed to do. So in as far as experts are concerned, that's how we are supporting the SMEs. Thank you. I think there's another benefit to that. I've had another conversation around uh, the paperless route. It's also to track if my application has come in, when mm. did it come in, how mm. long did it take for you to respond to mm. it. Um, and, and really it holds everybody accountable. It holds you accountable. It holds the SME accountable mm. to the dates provided. Am I correct? It is indeed, definitely. Well, I, and I, even I, for us, it has made things easier for us, you know, when everything has been done online. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, and, I, and I think we'll see much more accountability to SMEs to make sure that they, they do the part, they, they play their part effectively and it's visible, it's on technology. Mm. I think it's great. Mm. You know, Saki, they always say, you know, if you're going to buy a house, it's area, 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 area. If you're going to be an SME, what are the spaces, the sectors, the sectors, the sectors where we need our SMEs to be getting into and growing and expanding and helping the economy? Um, Zanele, that's always an interesting question. And for me, you know, the, there's two standard answers I, I give. The first one is that, you know, be in a business that makes money. Um, simplistic as it sounds, I mean, um, it could be, you could be in agriculture, you could be in tech, you could be, and we're finding now that one of the bigger areas of growth is where SMEs require purchase order funding, and this ranges in everything. It could be a business in construction. So for us, we're very big on the fact that entrepreneurs just have to make sure they get their business model right. It's clear who your customers are, how you're going to make the money and we can then finance. But naturally in the world we're in today, tech enabled businesses are really growing quite a lot. Um, whether it's e-commerce, I mean, you could be doing logistics, but a lot of those logistics have to fit into an e-platform that allows you to distribute, whether it's liquor, groceries, uh, clothing and 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 so a lot of tech enabled businesses it doesn't mean your business has to be tech it can be transport it can be mining it can be whatever it is but we're finding that where there's tech there's generally possibility to scale up but there are certain areas where you know people are doing very basic things like yesterday we showed um rental properties in townships and all that you know those entrepreneurs need is capital to be able to put up the structures because there still is a lot of vibrant um, rental market in townships. So it's not, um, we're not sector agnostic, we're not sector specific as um, GEP. We're sort of driven by what the entrepreneurs are looking at. Of course, the country and the province has certain province uh, priorities, but for us really, as long as the business case is strong, um, you know, we, we're really willing to, to fund them. Cornelius, the incubator, and I know that there are quite a few, um, and when we look at the, the, the scale of the SCZ incubator at OR Tambo and the number of SMEs that are there, as the NEF, do you sometimes feel the pressure of, of the visibility of your work within an incubator? Is it helping your organization to be much more responsive, perhaps, or to be agile uh, in terms of the support required by SMEs? Definitely, Vanelle. I think we, I wouldn't call it pressure, but I would call it um, 
um, we, uh, we actually work a lot in collaboration with the SEZ. We currently do have a couple of projects uh, in our pipeline that we are doing with the SEZ around the country. And we are very excited to actually have uh, the SEZ in, in, in Gauteng, um, in the OR Tambo area. Uh, we are pretty sure that there's going to be a whole lot of deals that we do in, in that space. When we, when we get involved, um, I mean, as you know, with the NEF, we are always looking for core partnerships, be it in the funding space as it is, or be it in the development uh, of the project themselves. We work together with the SEZ to make sure that these projects are developed to the stage where we can actually fund them. And uh, we, we actually reach out all the time. I mean, uh, the DTIC is, uh, is actually our, our shareholder and we reach out to them to ask for assistance all the time. And uh, every other uh, financial institution that's interested in funding with the NEF, but it's not so much the pressure but it is actually wanting to be involved all the time and wanting to make sure that we are at strategic places to make sure that we uh, get the economy up and running. Zanele. Um, Gyalaboha, let's come in from an SME perspective. Does the incubator also provide opportunities for, um, opportunities for your business? Do you find that it does help with positioning? It does help with bringing in um, you know, eyes um, and, and, and money into your products? Um, is it helping to be there? Absolutely, Zanel. Um, I'm going to make you just one example. Uh, a diamond jewelry fair there. We've been told the panel about export rate. I mean, I've been attending these trade fairs since 20. I was funded initially by the DTI, and exposure has been very critical in my you know, being able to take your products to the world and see what the, the market, your product ultimately ends up, then forms you in terms of decisions you make in regards to what it is you buy, what it is you manufacture, any what methods to employ in cutting and polishing diamonds that are most effective and cost effective as well. So, you know, being part of a SEZ is critical in that, you know, you, you, you're able to position your business correctly, you then have access to market because of the tax incentives that come with that. The export readiness aspect then enables you to be in a position where you, you're able to export, you know what the process is. It's not so difficult for you. Like I say, we've been doing it now since 2014. And with the establishment now of the SEZ at the Wartambo, specifically focusing on, on cutting and polishing, the industry can only grow and, and grow in South Africa, but also be a leader in the region in many countries in the Sadiq region produce diamond be the hub where many of those diamonds are cut and polished and jobs are created. So to answer your question simply, yes, yes, the, the S is, is, is critical to the development of any SME, I would say. And the more you talk about those diamonds, the more my mouth just waters, you know, because diamonds are absolutely a girl's best friend. So I look forward to seeing you at the SEZ. I'll be coming by to, to have a look at the stock. Thank you so much, uh, Cornelius, for your answer. Uh, and Gyele Bucha as well. And I want to go back to Cornelius and probably also to Usaki and, and speak of, I think, the projects that we are most excited about in, in the country. Which ones are sitting at SEZ? How are we seeing them also come to fruition, just like a Gelebocha's business is doing? And, and either one of you is welcome to take the question. Thank you, Vanelle. Uh, maybe uh, I'll, I'll go first. I think at the moment, the, the kind of projects that we have, I'll just mention uh, two. We've got um, one that is in the recycling uh, space. Um, they do... Um, um, uh, tire, it's tire recycling. Uh, we also have a project in the health sector um, where it's production of um, um, uh, 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 dialyzers. So these, these are products that are used in, in the health uh, space. But going forward, we really see, I think for me, I think earlier on you were asking what is the buzzword? What are the projects that are typically going to be making money in, in current uh, uh, terms? We are seeing a lot on our pipeline in the energy space. So projects that are, I mean, energy, energy is actually the buzzword at the moment, and we're seeing a whole lot of applications that are talking to um, uh, that, kind of, that kind of space. But at the same time, 
we get very excited when we get projects in the um, enforced industrial revolution uh, type of uh, transactions. You know, people that are more charismatic, people are more forward looking, looking into ways in which things can be done better, be it the running of the business itself or uh, uh, just making sure that everything, you know, uh, goes smoother, you know, in the current um, 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 ways of doing business. But yeah, that's basically what we do, yeah. Well, we look forward to seeing and hearing about more of them. I think the SCZ will be incubating quite a lot of interesting businesses, a conversation we need to continue. Saki, which ones for you have you got sitting within incubators um, and how are they doing? No, thanks, uh, Zanel. I think like Cornelius, um, we cover a lot of sectors and I'll make different examples um, about some of the stuff we've done. Let's take just the um, the ITZ. So within the ITZ, uh, part of what they do is to do training on people who are jewelry designers. Um, once they complete that training, um, they then need uh, funding further, some of them get employed and some of them start their own businesses. And um, that's one example. And the interesting one where I was saying, you know, sectors can be very fast. The ITZ also has another very key client, which is a food packaging business. Why at the airport is because they export most of their stuff. And because it is perishable, it is much easier for it to then be affrighted than if you are going to ship it or something else when it's going to other. So the sectors can be very different. So that one was funded largely by the GGDA. It's a bigger business. Um, they, they export. Uh, so from us, with the ITZ particularly, is then looking at those businesses which are there, um, you know, designers of jewellery who now want to take it to the next stage. Um, and that's where we would come in. I've made another example about the fund we launched yesterday. And just, I mean, uh, by way of perspective, two examples um, out of, you know, what we're launching. One was in Galfontaine, where these guys are doing the backyard rentals. Um, and one entrepreneur was saying um, they have eight rooms and out of those eight rooms, they make 35,000 rands a month and they were funded um, by one of these uh, implementing partners that we have. We have another entity that does purchase order finance. Um, so people get contracts and they don't have ability to fulfill them. So the the um, Creed was making an example that there's somebody who came to them needing five. 500,000 rands as working capital to fulfill a contract. So they had a contract from a government entity and government entities by design, you've got to deliver first and then they pay you after deliver and they can take up 30 days to, to, deli to pay you. So they then provided a funding arrangement and guarantees to the entity. And they're saying within months, uh, that business moved from a 500,000 a month turnover to 8 million rands a month turnover. Um, so they had access to a client who was willing to give them money, but w to give them work rather, but what they didn't have was the ability to finance. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we then do where we, we then identify what may be a challenge at different points. So if the challenge is training, we'll pay for the training, we don't do it directly. So you come as an entrepreneur and say, you know, I'm a diamond cutter, I need um, this kind of accreditation we pay for that you do it or you can say you know i've done a business plan i now have a market where i'm going to export something and i need a million rands as working capital um or you know i'm i've been running my business i need um injection of it or five million rands and that's what's gonna give me runway to operate over a 12 month period um, and i already have these markets open for me so it's different kinds of interventions but we always get really excited when there are entrepreneurs that are there again just on this fund i mean we'll put together a 400 million rands fund um, and within six months 75 percent of it was committed and in the next two, three months, 100% of it is going to be committed. On our own, um, you know, normal investment program, first half of the year, we had 70% commitments into it. So there's real take up by entrepreneurs in the market who are looking for funding. But of course, I mean, funds are always limited, so we're not able to fund everyone that is applying. But we will basically 
you know, as I said, like NAF and, and IDC will fund any part of the value chain. Thank you. And I think SMEs need to understand the need to take, you know, to, to take what they need um, across that value chain. So what we're doing is two parallel processes. You're talking about um, enabling the SME, then we are enabling them to trade through through access to, to funds when they have clients. But Zanele, to come back to you, I, I think you've joined us again, is if I now look at the Africa Free um, Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, we now also want them to get ready Ready to export. Extrapolate a bit more for me in, in, in that readiness process. You know, how are we how are we may helping them to get ready? And then and then I'll come back, Tepi. You can also come in immediately afterwards. You know, we, we can just come in, have a conversation around where do we see the need for um for uh, for, for South African SMEs to export their products? Uh, over to you two. Um, thank you, um, Zanele. So the AFCFTA basically is a key driver of uh, um, continental integration. Um, and, and, and what we're doing as GGDA is to empower the SMMEs with information. We're training them on the rules of origin. We're training them on um, INCO terms. And we've got various partners that we work with. Um, and over and above the training, we also assist them then to um, access funding. Um, for example, recently we had training with Afrosim Bank um, and the International Trade Center, which was really practicalizing things for the SMMEs in terms of how do you get from point A to point B. And that includes logistics, how to basically um, look at contracting. Well, you find that a lot of SMMEs, um, when they don't have this information, they go to new markets, they lose money, they don't know how to operate, they don't know how to structure the contracts. Um, so I think elements like government are really important in um, arming them. And this will also include the issue of patent. You know, how do we protect our SMMEs because um, it's a jungle out there. So we really do um, arm them uh, to be to be ready. We also assist them to basically come up with uh, or formulate um, entry market strategies. Um, the other thing that we've done as the GGDA, because we believe in strategic partnerships, um, within the continent, basically, we have identified key regions uh, which basically um, will be the soft lending pad for our businesses. So if businesses want to access the west of the continent, they will enter through the Ghana market. We have uh, private and government uh, partners that we work with. We have identified key sectors um, and we basically link up the SMMEs with opportunities. So an SMME in pharmaceuticals basically will be linked up with opportunities in the West uh, market, and we will handhold them until um, they land and, and, and start uh, doing business. Um, so in a sense, basically, um, that's what we're doing. We will also look at other regions um, like the East and the North. We uh, have just finalized um, uh, partnerships with uh, uh, private entities in the North, and that will be in the auto sector. So we will be taking basically M SMMEs who are manufacturing, um, you know, components like tires, um, that's in demand in, in, in the North. Um, so we will be uh, taking them to uh, those markets and assisting them also with uh, 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 trade finance. We don't offer the trade finance. We will refer them to your GEP, but we also work with uh, uh, private uh, sectors, as I've said earlier. We also have uh, private sector players who basically sometimes they look for equity in terms of uh, partnering with the, with the SMMEs. Um, so we, we do that uh, in the main. And uh, to further market their products, like I said earlier, we've uh, come into the uh, e-portal space so e-commerce space where basically we have an exporter portal they can load their products or services um, and the portal is outward facing so the buyers basically will be placing orders through the portal and we will be improving the system as as, as we go along so there are various partnerships that uh, we are putting in place and programs to make sure that our businesses um, are basically armed to compete uh, globally thank you Tepi, please come in and let's talk about products to the markets that Uzanella was referring to. What are you seeing as mm -hmm. the trend? Where are we starting off uh, in terms of positioning S South African SMEs to the rest of the continent? Um, I think over and above what uh, Zanella has already said, we do partner with a number of uh, technical institutions as the DTIC in order to ensure that those uh, SMEs that intend to operate in the export market know, for instance, that there's an ECIC that can assist them with insurance, at least to de-risk, you know, their, you know, their processes and all that. 
And at the same time, we partner with institutions like Productivity uh, South Africa, where they are working on improving the competitiveness of the SMEs and even their products. Because to operate in the global market, you have to make sure that you are competitive. Whether your product is good or not, it has to be acceptable in that particular market where you want to, you know, you want to, you know, sell your product. But over and above that, through our trading, you know, investment South Africa, it helps us to assist SMEs in identifying markets where they can sell uh, their products. Let me just make an example. Somebody in an agro-processing um, sector who's located there at the Gauteng, you know, um, SEZ, they want to sell their products in, maybe in West Africa, as someone has already said. Our um, TISA colleagues will be able to identify within that West African market to say, here is a country that would certainly need the product that you want to sell. Instead of taking it to pro, uh, country A, it is more required in country B. So you have a market already available for you in country B, and there is so much that they import and there's so much that they export. So with the tool that they have internally, we are able to you know, advise, provide that advice to our SMEs that you can enter this market. This one is already too congested, stay away from it and all that. But over and above that, we also partner with our agencies, the SABS, the Innovation Hub, CSIR, to make sure that the quality that is produced of the, uh, of the product is that which is required by the market. And at least if they reach that quality or exceed it, and meet whatever regulatory requirements are required in external markets, they will be able to, you know, compete, you know, fairly mm. in those particular uh, markets. But over and above that, as the DTIC within the strategic partnerships and customer care unit that I had, we also provide free training to SMEs through webinars, workshops, um, just engagements like we're engaging today, we have a set, uh, you know, a program of webinars that we conduct twice, you know, a month, where we are going to talk about a particular incentive. So SMEs are invited to participate. And once they have attended that webinar, we will follow up with those that are serious and need more information. What we are doing is actually hand-holding the SMEs to understand the requirements of the incentives that we offer. Not only the requirements of the incentives, but compliance issues that are associated with the type of products that they make in the food industry, in the pharmaceutical and such industries. There's a lot of regulation. So it's important that even before they submit their applications, we have taken them through what the requirements are, so that by the time they submit their applications, at least these are compliant, you know, uh, applications. We also work, or we also collaborate with uh, business um, chambers, uh, sector bodies, mm -hmm. where we make sure that they invite their members to the sessions that we have with them, so that as the chamber, we can certainly say, We've engaged with all the members of this particular sector. We've imparted this type of information. And if there's a need for follow-up, they will let us know. And then we go to individual companies. And this is how we support the SMEs that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do have a question from our audience and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to it. I just want to tell you what it is so that you can think about it. And then, and then I want to ask a question uh, to Ukiya Lebucha. One of our guests is, say, is asking, are there interventions to assist SMEs with localization? Please think about it. I'll come back to that question and, and, and see who would like to, to respond to it. Uh, Ukiya Lebucha, you know, well, the question that I wanted to, to pose to you is that you've entered a very tough industry and you are also entering it um, 
end to end. So right from the sourcing to the polishing to the designing to the actual making of the diamonds and then and then to, to the selling component of it. What has been important for you? How do you get it right? Because I think a lot of SMEs need to get into industries that are tough to get into and not just sell the end product, but actually be responsible for the entire, you know, the entire value chain of their businesses, of their business or the business, the industry that they want to get into. How have you done it? What has worked for you that can get, shed light to another SME who wants to create and sell? I think partnerships. Partnerships is how I've been able to, to basically build my business. I remember the first time I got into the diamond industry, there was a lady at a company called the State Diamond Trader. She was a CEO there. Mm -hmm. She was very passionate about the development of young people in the diamond industry. She, she then decided, you know, as a, as a young person coming to her, saying to her, I have a vision. You know, when, you, when you're young, you can have all kinds of dreams. She, number one, had the time to sit down with me and talk to me about this vision. She took me through the process of applying for a diamond beneficiation license. She then was, was incredibly creative in how she, she did her job as the CEO of the State Diamond Trader. And that she was intentional about uh, affording us access to overseas markets. I remember in 2014, I went to, through the support of the DTI, I went to Tokyo, I went to London, I went to Hong Kong. Again, you know, to reiterate the point I made earlier on market access. And through the, the partnership with the State Diamond Trader, I was able to form more partnerships. I approached DBS, um, well, we're now clients at DBS, and we buy a substantial amount of rough diamonds. And, and we've, we've been able to sustain ourselves in that way. I mean, to, to any other entrepreneur who's listening, who's thinking, how do you, they say, if you, don't stick, you, if you don't stick your neck out, like in the example of a, a turtle, yeah? If you don't stick your neck out, you won't move, you won't go anywhere. So it's, it's all in the, the function of taking a risk asking the right questions. And what I'm liking about this panel is I'm realizing even with myself that there's such a lot of information out there that I haven't had access to. And I'm, I'm quite encouraged to know that there's so many platforms one can tap into. And Saki, I will be calling GEP about that 5 million rand. You know how we are as entrepreneurs. <laughs> but but all, all in all, it's just, it's, it's all about having a vision, executing on it, being consistent, asking the right questions and being willing to learn. That's, that's me simply answering that question. Beautifully answered. Um, Gelo, I think what you're speaking of is, is used to be very hard for, for entrepreneurs to do. I, I don't think it's, I, I think they're learning the lesson. One has to ask the question. One has to have courage and one has to form partnerships. You cannot shy away from it if you want to grow a meaningful business. So how about we throw that question back to the rest of the panel members? Um, how do they, where do they go? You know, what are the interventions to assist SME, SMEs? And we're talking about localization because it's tough to capture any market, no matter what your product is. How do they go about capturing and, and giving, getting access and localizing their business and growing it within um, the, the, the local market? Um, and, and also throw in for me, where do they get to get a lot of the information that you've shared today? Because it's about them going in, tapping and looking and finding it. Where do they go? Sh sh do you want to kick us off, Zanele? Um, thank you. So what we're doing, Zanele, we're work working with the multinationals basically um, to uh, localize and get our SMMEs into the uh, value chains. Uh, we've got key programs. Uh, we have one in the energy space uh, where basically um, the multinational outlines uh, opportunities in the space where our um, SMMEs uh, can come on board. Um, and we have an on onboarding program. Um, we started with this program um, last year, and uh, so far there is, uh, I think, uh, two uptakes. We'll get, I think, uh, the final report as we go along um, in the in, in the quarter. Um, and the other thing is really what we're trying to do is to, like I said, we need to make them to be competitive um, because you find that some of um, the inputs that are required, uh, they they are, they themselves are importing from somewhere. You know, so we need to train them and the way we train them now, we have made our training to be sector specific um, so that we give a detailed training and information 
on how to improve uh, uh, their production, on how to basically get into the space and also then provide um, uh, the linkages. So it's, 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 it's a program that we, um, it's a three year program. Um, we are going to be wrapping it up in the next two years. So we will get uh, most of the results as we wrap up. But in the main, we are looking at um, a training of uh, 200 um, entities and it's not an easy one. So what we are trying to do because um, we need to customize the solutions. They've got uh, different needs. Um, and to make sure that they really do uh, enter into the value chains, we have to uh, provide undivided attention into them. So once again, with uh, with our partners, uh, including Open Trade Gate Sweden, we have uh, narrowed down the, tr the type of training that we are, we are um, providing to look at specific interventions for the SMMEs. And uh, they are welcome basically to come through to the GGDA. We we have our subsidiaries as well, which are, are sector specific, um, and uh, they assist uh, companies from ideation right up to com commercialization. For example, uh, the Inno Innovation Hub, um, it's looking at smart industries. So if you have companies um, that don't know where to start, they have the idea and they want to get into the space, um, they must just go to the GGDA website uh, to find information there. Thank you. Saki, where do SMEs go? Um, no, thank you, Sanele. Um, I mean, I think uh, maybe as Giala Bukha was saying, the first general point to make is that um, get out there. Um, the information is mostly available publicly. Um, I mean, most of the DFIs, for example, they have a website, there's social media. There's a lot more stuff now that gets put out on social media. That's often a starting point. And I think once you talk to one um, DFI, if something is not in their mandate, they will most likely refer you to somebody else. So if let's say you know the itc has a limit on you know the minimum that they accept we have a joint fund with them they will refer you to us um same thing on us if we want to um finance something and it's a it's a higher check size we can go to cifa uh, we can go to the itc we can go to tbsa if somebody wants to do um, an equity transaction um, uh, cornelius is probably better at it than we are we've referred to them franchises we've referred to them student accommodation because that's what they do so i think the first step often is getting to at least one state-owned company if you're looking for more risk capital because we take more risks than commercial banks do and I think once you've started the journey, I think a lot of entrepreneurs maybe, I don't know, you know, find it difficult to 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 gain the access or the confidence to go to the entities. But I think once you've um, reached out to one, because all of us have targets to meet, we need to disperse funds. So there is an incentive to reach out to entrepreneurs and get to them. So. The simple answer for me is that start, you know, searching on what's available in the surface. Um, it may be a lot of information. It may, you know, may not all be relevant. But I think once you get to one institution, you have a better chance of them referring you to the other. Um, Zanele, the GGTA, they do that because they don't do direct financing uh, into businesses. So if you need... Um, you know, alone, they will say, okay, go to GP, go to ITC, go to NEF. So there's, you know, those kinds of different portals that will point you to the right place. But I think just a Google search of development finance institutions, you'll find their provincial ones or national ones, but just go to, to one as a start. And then you're most likely to be referred somewhere else if it doesn't fit within their mandate. But a lot of them, in truth, have overlapping mandates. So if you've gotten into one, you will understand what the requirements are in terms of business plans and compliance. Um, and if you know they happen to not be in your sector, they will refer you to another GFI. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Saki. I think what's good is that there's so much more collaboration between all of you, including the GDDA and, and Zanelli referring to the fact that if, if you just plug in and you start somewhere and then stay the course, don't give up, you know, until you find the place you need to be and you have the, the paperwork that's required to do that. Cornelius, though, I think one of the 
the challenges a lot of SMEs will say about the funding institutions uh, and a lot of places where they're supposed to go and get support is turnaround time. Has that improved greatly, especially with the system that I think I would say Zanella was referring to? You know, have, have our speed to respond um, to SMEs improved, especially the period from when I've completed everything I needed to provide to the point where I get the actual funding? Have we done better? Thank you so much. Perhaps before I address that question, I just want to go back to the loca localization issue. I think it's uh, one of the things that really exci excites us because um, localization actually is perfectly in line with IPEP as well as um, the National Development Plan. So those are the things that we do. Um, we try and make sure that when they are in line with those, uh, they actually even get um, rates that are more uh, competitive because of exactly that. We are also wanting to be seen to be supporting the national programs uh, in order to make sure that projects that we do are in line with those. Um, in terms of the turnaround times, um, I think um, we have improved um, and we are continually improving, but of course we are still getting some, um, some, some saying, you know, we, uh, things are taking long and all of that, but I think it's just the nature of the game. Uh, there are times when the pipeline is just so long and we can only do so much. But um, I think um, judging by the successes that we have had, um, I think we have really, really improved. But maybe one more point that I would like to make about that. COVID has taught us to do things much faster. I think um, it has taught us to do things differently. Uh, everything is done online these days, which has actually made things much, much faster. Actually, uh, during COVID, uh, some of those COVID deals, we managed to close them within uh, a week or two. And uh, I think there are very big learnings that we are taking from that. In closing, I just want to say um, people must reach out. I think what Saki has said, I think, captures it correctly to say people must just reach out, get to our website, get to the information is there. Come through to the NEF. We assist even before funi uh, uh, funding itself. We assist people with business plans. We assist people to put together those projections and, and all of those. So whatever assistance is needed, we do have a department that actually works through uh, those kinds of things. Zanele. I don't know if you can close for us, uh, please, Gelebuha. Speak to me about that exact question. What does it take from a, 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 an admin, uh, a red tape, um, and, and, and is the SCZ incubated or Watambo making that easier? I think let, let me answer the question by saying this. Anything that's worthwhile takes time. Uh, this is not in any way trying to excuse government. At times, things do take longer than they should. But you, you, want, you want to say you're going to put whatever application through a, a rigorous process that ultimately has you with the answer yes or no to the funding request. So I, I've, I've, I've been fortunate to, to be quite persistent. If you don't answer the phone, I will call you 10 times. I will get you to send, I'll get somebody to send you an email. You will have to say yes to me at some point. So I think to just advise those that would say it takes too long, I think persistence is, is one of the things that we need to all have as entrepreneurs. It's not going to fall on your lap. It's going to take a lot of work. Sometimes you'll be told you're wrong. You have to go back, redo the business plan, whatever the case is. You have to be willing to go through the process if you believe in your vision. So to answer the question simply, we have to stay the course. We have to stay the course. And it is not an easy course whatsoever. Thank you so much to all my guests today. I think it has been really a fruitful conversation. And thank you to everybody that's watched. If you could let yourself go with just one, one final word of encouragement, one final benefit to working towards finding yourself at an SCZ type of an incubator, what would it be? And maybe I can just ask, um, you know, one or two of you just to lean in and say, you know, how would you encourage SMEs to have hope and to continue to fight until they find themselves not only trading locally but internationally. Yeah, maybe Zanele, look, um, you have one entrepreneur who's here, um, and you know, and he was t saying about what it takes. I mean, I've also walked the journey of being an entrepreneur, and uh, and and a lot of it you've got to start. Um, you've got to accept that at times when you deal with clients, their requirements may be different and you need to find solutions to them. 
um, development finance institutions are using taxpayers' money. Um, so when they say we need a business plan, we need compliance, unfortunately, it has to be done because if that business fails, and the documentation was not there, we get looked at as having been reckless. So a lot of it requires hard work. It can be painful. You may think it is unnecessary, but you're dealing with people who have different incentives than you. You want your business to succeed. For them, they are looking at the risk and saying, if things go wrong, what do we have to fall on? And in, in most occasions, the falling on is on the rigor of the process. So anyone can apply. These things are available for all South Africans. Um, there isn't anything special about anyone to qualify onto them. It's getting the information, understanding the sector you're in, because the more you you know you zoom in into a sector is the more you understand you understand the risks and and if you're an entrepreneur and a startup in most occasions really the funder is backing you as a jockey than even the business so they've got to believe you are you know committed to the business you have knowledge in it if you don't have the knowledge at least you have access to the knowledge and what it is that is going to take you out there i think generally south africa has accepted that growth is going to come from smes there's a lot of enterprise development pro projects in corporates so there is you know the right noise the right energy and more money getting into smes so i think if you push long enough you are definitely going to get into that there is no special human being that qualifies for it it really takes you as an entrepreneur to get into it thank you thank you so much do i have time for tepi very quickly tepi to round it off for me yeah, yeah. Yeah, certainly. I was saying whenever we talk to SMEs, we encourage them to be members of a proud South African because once they take that membership, they're going to meet other people who need their products locally where they would not even know because we have this, you know, buyer-seller, you know, sessions where they meet and discuss and suddenly somebody finds that here's this company that I didn't know about but and that would need to know uh, my products and all that. And Amazing. people need to be patient and understand that we are come to South Africans, to Parliament. So when some of these requirements are there in the documents, we are not trying to be mean. Mm -hmm. It's because we've got multiple stakeholders, uh, stakeholders yeah. that we need to, yeah, to, 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 to comply respond with. to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tepi. You always drop, you, you've, you've shared many gems today. Thank you so much. And thank you to all mm -hmm. of you. It has been an amazing conversation. I do believe that you have given our SMEs who are listening a, a great insight and courage. And, and, um, and, and I suppose all they have to do now is do something as simple as join Proudly SA. That's where we'll leave mm -hmm. this conversation for the day. Uh, thank you so much, Tepi So Makoti, the Chief Director of the Strategic Partnerships and Customer Care, Industrial Financing Branch at the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Zanele Fagude, thank you. She's the Head of Trade Export Development at GGDA. Saki Zamaga, CEO of the Gauteng Enterprise Propeller. Cornelius, thank you so much. Mr. Mluli, the Senior Investment Associate at Strategic Projects Funds at the National Empowerment Fund. And last but not least, Kiale Bukapule. Good luck, Mr. Diamonds. Until next time, I'll see you again.